Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we are welcoming a very special guest presenter today, Dr. Heather Keller. So Heather is the Slagle Research Chair in Nutrition and Aging at the University of Waterloo, so Ontario joining us today, and scientist with AgriFood for Healthy Aging. Heather's research is focused on the continuum of care and improving the nutritional status and food intake of older adults. As co-chair of the Canadian Malnutrition Task Force, Heather leads an interprofessional team mandated to promote the prevention, detection, and treatment of malnutrition in the acute care setting. Heather also leads the Making the Most of Mealtimes research group and a recently completed prevalence study which identifies multifactorial determinants of food intake in long-term care. So I think we're in very good hands today with Heather. So thank you again for joining us and I'll just turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. And do I have just the right slides up there? I don't have the notes slide. Which one do you see? I see the right one, yes. Okay, thank great, thanks very much. So it's a great pleasure to be here today to talk with you about one of my passions, which is eating well, especially when we might have more challenges in our life with dementia. And this is a growing area of, of research and interest for a lot of people because we now recognize that uh, people living with dementia in the community have every right to be eating well and be healthy and that we're going to try to get across that message today. So I'd also like to acknowledge my land acknowledgement here where I am at the University of Waterloo in the Schlegel UW Research and Super Aging, that we're located on the traditional territory of the Attawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The RA is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. And you may not have heard about the Research Institute for Aging that I'm part of. So I work at the university as well as uh, have an appointment at the Schlegel UW Research Institute. And this research institute is focused in on trying to improve aging through a variety of organizations. So our vision is a world where research is driving innovation to enrich the journey of aging. Our mission is to enhance the quality of life and care of older adults through partnerships in research, education, and practice. And our values are excellence, relevance, collaboration, transparency, and inclusion. So today, I have the following learning outcomes. I'm going to be talking about why it why it is what what we eat is why why is that important I should say and how we eat why are those two things important especially when living with dementia to think about key nutrition recommendations for older adults in general and also discuss tips to support mealtimes and challenges for people living with dementia at this point in time as well as some other considerations around eating well together when living with dementia. So first off, a high quality diet is important no matter your age, life stage or health condition. A high quality nutrient dense diet supports our overall health and well-being. And you're probably wondering, what do I mean by nutrient dense? Those two words that I've underlined here. We'll get into that in just a moment. What a nutrient dense diet. But we do know that every body system continually needs nutrients. And so this is why throughout your life you need nutrition. It's not just when you're growing as a child or when you're pregnant as a woman um, that you need good nutrition. You need it throughout your life. Your tissues are constantly turning over. And the way your body functions will depend on what you eat. Thinking about a car, which is an oversimplistic way of thinking about it, but if you don't put gasoline in the car, it's going to affect how it runs. Same thing with eating. If we don't eat the right types of foods or we don't eat enough food, it will affect our function. What we eat is actually associated with a wide variety of diseases and specifically chronic diseases like heart disease, cancer, etc. We also know that many diet diseases are managed through diet. Think about diabetes mellitus, for example, type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes, but also cardiovascular disease and cancer. We actually manage the uh, disease state through what we eat as well, showing the importance of food to our health. And we also know that when we eat well and we've gone in for a surgery or had another illness, that will actually be help us to recover from that illness, that surgery, if we have a good nutritional status. So it's very important to eat as well as we can for as long as we can to support our health. 
As well, we now know that a nutrient dense diet, and again, I'm going to go through what that means in just a moment, but a nutrient dense diet is associated actually with a healthy brain, again, at all ages. And so why it's important to try to eat a healthy diet uh, regardless of your age. So what is a high quality nutrient dense diet? This is a diet that has more vitamins, minerals and protein and fewer calories, added fats, sugars and salt. It's thinking about eating more whole foods versus processed foods, for example. And if you do eat processed foods, those that have fewer ingredients. So longer list means there's lots of other things in there we might not want to be eating, chemicals and such. Canada's Food Guide, which is on the right hand side, a depiction of that so that came out of the DREAM uh, project that we'll hear a little bit more about later on, uh, shows you what we should be eating. So half of our plate should be fruits and vegetables, preferably whole fruits and vegetables. So this can be frozen, canned or fresh. A quarter of our plate should be lean protein sources, meat, poultry, cheese, eggs, milk products as well would fit in there and soy products as well. And then the bottom quarter would be whole grain foods, uh, things like whole grain um, bread, pasta, etc. So you want to have a mix of these foods in these proportions, preferably at every meal. And if you think about a snack as well, think about having two of those things or at least one of those things at a snack. So an apple, for example, or an apple and a glass of milk uh, would be a very nice snack as well. What you won't see on here are things that are high in sugar and salt and fat, things like potato chips, candy bars, cookies, pies, um, cakes, that sort of thing. Those are considered other foods which have very little nutrition in them. They have calories, yes, but very little nutrients like vitamins and minerals. Specific to older adults, we actually have some nutrients we need more of. And this is because of our, the way our body works as we age. It sometimes changes the ability to absorb nutrients, or it might be the way that the, the nutrients, speak, thinking of specifically vitamin D, we make it through skin, uh, through the sun rays coming to our skin. That changes with age, our capacity to do that. So as we age, we actually need these three nutrients in higher amounts, calcium, vitamin D, and vitamin B6. Calcium is one of those nutrients that's a mineral that is in several foods, but in various proportions. And the best uh, food products where you're going to get a lot of calcium in are often dairy products, but also almonds and other uh, dark green leafy vegetables have calcium in them as well. The key is that we need 1200 milligrams per day for women over the age of 51 years and for men that are 71 years of age and older. We tend not to absorb and use calcium the same way when we're older, and this is why there's a higher requirement as we age. For vitamin D, the requirement for older adults that are under the age of 70 years is 600 international units, and for people over the age of 70 years, it's 800 international units. Vitamin D is often inadequate in our diet. It's fortified in a few key foods like margarine and milk products and soy or um, beverages that are considered milk alternatives, but it's in very few foods naturally. Where it is showing up is in, in some uh, things like cod liver oil, for example. You might have remembered my father used to take cod liver oil every day, uh, even um, when he was young right through into old age. These two nutrients, calcium and vitamin D, we tend not to eat enough in our diet. And this is why we might need to require a supplement as we age to meet these needs. Vitamin B6 is the other nutrient that we need more of as we age, but we actually tend to get enough of this in our diet quite readily if we follow a very varied diet. Older adults also may need more vitamin B12. It's not because the requirement itself increases, but because we sometimes will be taking medications that will decrease the acid in our stomach. And this will then result in the B12 we eat in food not being absorbed very well. So about 10 to 30% of people that are older, over the age of 50, have poor absorption B12. So if you happen to be on a medication that's um, helping to reduce the acid in your stomach and affecting your what we call reflux of that acid into your, into your esophagus, 
check with your doctor, get a serum B12 measurement done, and you can take a simple B12 pill that's in a large enough amount that it actually overcomes the problem of absorption when there's no acid in your stomach. Another key area that I want to focus in on is protein. Many older adults are surprised to realize they actually need more protein than their grandchildren do. And this is because our bodies are not very good as we age with taking the protein we eat, breaking it down, and putting it into the muscle that we need to keep our function. So we need high quality protein throughout the day to meet our protein requirements as we age. Those high quality protein sources include lean meat, poultry, fish, low-fat dairy products, eggs, and soy products. I would also put in there soy milk would be an alternative as well. When you're buying milk alternatives like oat milk or almond milk, look carefully at the package because you'll see that many of them have very little protein in them compared to a glass of milk or a glass of soy beverage, which is about 8 grams um, in a 250 ml uh, um, portion. These other products, unless they're fortified with protein, and some are now, they realize they need to be competitive on the protein side as well. Um, many of them only have 1 or 2 grams of protein in them. The key is that we have a variety of sources of protein in our diet. Um, I'm not a great proponent of a vegan diet as people age. It's very hard to get enough nutrients in our bodies in a vegan diet, which means we eat no animal products at all. A vegetarian diet, which includes eggs and milk products, uh, cheese, usually gets enough nutrition through a vegetarian diet as we age. But there's benefits of both plant-based proteins as well as animal-based proteins. Some nutrients that you will find in plant-based proteins like legumes, for example, soy, are fiber uh, and some B vitamins. With respect to animal source of protein, you'll get calcium, vitamin D, as well as some other key minerals. So having a variety of plant sources will make sure you're getting enough of the micronutrients you need. You should aim for about 20 grams of protein at each meal and 1 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram of your body weight per day. So if you weigh 60 kilograms, you should eat between 60 and 90 grams of protein per day. That may not seem like very much, but on the next slide, you'll sh I'll show you what it what some key foods are that we eat and how much protein they have and you realize you just can't rely on one single meal to get you to that 90 grams of protein if you're a 60 kilogram person. So here we have some high protein sources. Greek style yogurt about a three quarter of a cup will give you 18 grams. Again this would be a, an animal based source of protein and it's a high amount as you can see. Cottage cheese half a cup about 12 grams. We'll slip down now to more of um, an, a plant-based plant product like almonds. So 23 almonds are often more, are recommended to, to build up uh, have as a snack, for example, gives a good amount of calcium in there, but it's only 6 grams of protein. And almonds, 23 almonds is quite a few calories actually. If we look as well at uh, tofu, one cup of tofu, it tends to be not as caloric dense, but it has 20 grams of protein. So it would be a better choice if you're trying to watch calories, but have more protein. You can see that chicken, three ounces, 28 grams, which you'll see with the edamame, black beans, lentils, almonds, as well as peanut butter, there's less protein and they tend to have actually more calories too to get the right amount of protein. So if I wanted to get to 20 grams of protein for almonds, for example, that'd be four servings of almonds to get there and that'd be quite a few calories. So if you're trying to balance calories and protein, choose those leaner sources, um, tofu if you're a plant-based um, preference, or things like chicken without the skin on it would be a very good choice, or a low-fat um, low dairy product. So now that we've talked about what we should be eating, I want to now spend a bit of time talking about how we eat or the way we eat. And I think this is also very important. And this understanding that I had, I probably had it from being, being a child as well, but I started to do research in this area when I was talking to families living with dementia in the community. We were asking them about what, 
what makes a mealtime meaningful to you and recognizing that um, it was an important part of their lives and should be nurtured then. And we learned from them some key things that I want to transmit to you now. First off, I've got in italics there um, a, a quote from a, a sociologist researcher who says that what meals are are occasions when two or more people gather together primarily for the purpose of sharing food consumption. So in this definition, which you may argue with, but it, it, it seems to indicate it's that two or more people, right? That interaction that's happening, it's not just the food consumption. And so mealtimes then have this other component to them, not just consumption of food. We know that meals have symbolic meaning, thinking about you might have celebratory meals in your family or in your tradition. They provide a place for socialization. And in fact, sociologists and family researchers often will use the mealtime as a place to understand parenting behavior, family dynamics, because it is an opportunity to see that uh, over a key activity in the family. It's also a way that we have a belonging. Think about when you are um, visiting someone and they offer you a beverage it's to make you feel welcome or being offered uh, coming to someone's home and being offered a meal. It gives a sense that you belong with the family at the meal. As well, it's a foundation for almost every culture for social integration, for, for community building and cultural meaning. And so mealtimes are a very important part of our lives beyond the food itself. So I've got a couple of quotes here actually from that study I was talking about where we talked to individuals and their family care partners in the community. And I'll just give you a moment to read those over. But you can see how meals nourish not only the body, but also the soul. So in this study, we actually had uh, diverse um, families living with dementia. And I can remember one lady from the first year, her husband actually did not communicate very much verbally. And one of her quotes, she said, you know, mealtime might be the only time he'll say anything. He might even just be, thank you, dear. Uh, but that to her was very meaningful as the care partner. And so mealtimes became a cherished time for her. So mealtimes can promote connections, they can support our identity as individuals and as a family, and also help us to cope and adapt. And this is what we learned from those families living with dementia when we talked to them over a six year period. It's a sense of well-being and uh, belonging that we think is important. I've tried to then think about how we can translate this into long-term care, for example, and how mealtimes are delivered, or thinking even about people living in the community and the way that meals are offered. How can we use the sensibility around the importance of mealtimes to nourish the family, including those living with dementia? Here we can see a couple of quotes when mealtimes are not that sense of belonging or well-being and how emotionally challenging it is for people. So I'll just take, give you a little moment to read over these again, again from the very same study that I was talking about. So on the left hand side in the blue lettering, this is a lady who is talking about, you know, if her husband made a mistake at mealtime, say he spilled something or um, something went wrong. She was talking about you don't want to be angry uh, with him because it would affect his sense of dignity. And on the right hand side, similarly, if someone feeling their identity being lost because they were not able to do the cooking that they used to do for their family. And so you can see how challenging it can be when changes happen with dementia and mealtimes are such a large part of the family, how it can affect the dynamics that are going on. So I'm going to go through some of our learnings from this work about how we can support connecting identity and connectivity and con continuity, I should say. So how can we support connecting through mealtimes? So meals, because we eat them several times a day, at least two times, maybe three, uh, and maybe even snacks as well together, provide a dedicated time and proximity 
And so people feel they're closer to each other, can share then, and feel like they're connected in some shape or form. For persons living with memory changes, when they're eating, there's less pressure then for them to talk. So they can feel like they're participating just by listening and don't have to be part of the conversation in terms of responding in the same way that if you didn't have food in front of you. If the mealtime has a calm environment, um, uh, it can support this connecting happening. So think about calming music, uh, not uh, rushed mealtime. Make it more of a ritual. This can help that connecting to happen. So sitting down together, for example, to eat, not rushing it, um, taking the time it takes to eat a meal. You can also use conversation aids, reminisce, talk about the food, it's in the present moment, and talk about opinions or preferences rather than details like remembering um, what happened yesterday, for example. I can remember one again, one of our family members talked about um, their family, they had a very large family uh, of children. And one Christmas, one of the daughters um, recognized that her father who had dementia was starting to lose capacity for conversation at meals. So what they did was put um, every one of the children in the family, put a memory in there about the grandfather or the father and put it, it and the, the wife then put it into um, a fishbowl. And at the beginning of the meal, after things were plated, they would pull out one of the little notes from the fishbowl and read out the memory that the child had of the grandparents or the or the or their parents. And this was a nice way for them to have a conversation about that event or that activity and reminisce. If you're eating with others, it sometimes can be challenging to follow the conversation when a person has memory changes and memory loss. And so the care partner can summarize key points of the conversation to help keep the person living with dementia feel included. And thinking about when you're going out to eat and keeping it very simple might be a way to also support that connecting. If you have a complex meal, um, it can make it distracting in a way if you think about it that way. Uh, keep it rather simple. That will also again support that connecting to happen. Oops. So how can we support identity and continuity? So the continuity of the family, continuity of the self. So recognize that there's lots of meaningful activities in mealtime tasks. It can be washing the vegetables for the salad. It can be um, stirring the pot of soup. It can be um, putting things in the refrigerator and taking them out. It can be setting the table. There's lots of meaningful activities around food in the home, grocery shopping, um, preparing the food, and even eating the food is also a meaningful role, right? So share those tasks, be flexible in the moment, recognizing that capacity changes. Um, I remember again, one family as part of our study that we did in the community, um, the wife actually had dementia, but was had no physical challenges and the husband was in a wheelchair. And so they relied on each other to do the cooking. So um, the wife who had some memory changes, she relied on her husband to walk her through a recipe, for example, but he relied on her for getting things out of the oven because he couldn't bend over and pull things out of the oven, for example. Focus on what's important, which is the being together. Not that it's done perfectly, not that it's done right, not that it's on time, but it's the fact that you're doing something together. And this again supports identity and continuity. Keep traditions that are unique to the family and individuals where you can. So um, I can remember again, uh, one woman saying, you know, getting together, they realized over time was the, the more important thing, not the who made this dish or whatever. And so she recognized over time as well, she, she was living with dementia, that the pie that she made was more important than all the rest of the dinner. And so she'd focus in on just making the pie and they worried about, you know, catering or something else like that, or people doing potluck for the rest of the meal, because that to her was the most important part of that tradition that she had the opportunity to make this special dessert for her family. And then finally, protect dignity. People make mistakes, right? And so don't worry about it. Um, recognize that that's just, that's just today. It's not a big deal and move on and protect the individual's dignity that's made that mistake. Here are some tips that can support specific mealtime challenges. So sometimes individuals who might be living alone with memory changes forget to eat or drink. Set an alarm or a call to remind them or have or eat with others. This will then remind individuals that it's a mealtime. 
If you have a hard time finding things in the cupboards, label the cupboards um, or store supplies together that make sense. For example, if you um, have your coffee grinder with the coffee in the cupboard together, that makes sense rather than in two different cupboards. When using kitchen appliances, you can use cue cards for instructions or find simplistic um, appliances that don't take a lot of a lot of um, remembering how it works. Things that have an automatic shut off like a kettle, for example. An induction oven is a really good choice as well now because the, the element itself is not hot until the proper pot is put on it. Chewing and swallowing, finding foods that are easier to chew and swallow and adding moisture uh, to the foods. If you're uh, a person who uh, eats with the individual who might have chewing or swallowing palms, no first aid so you know how to deal with a choking incident and talk to their healthcare provider about other techniques and strategies, perhaps a referral to a speech language pathologist who specializes in dysphagia or a dietitian who also might specialize in that area. Challenges of self-feeding or drinking, think about adaptive utensils, vessels, or, or finger foods, quite frankly. Almost all foods can be eaten with your fingers. So it's getting rid again of our perceptions about what's right and wrong and not worrying about it. Eating too much. High fiber foods can actually fill a person up when they're consumed with water as well. High protein foods are also very satiating. By drinking water before the meal, it can also make you feel a bit fuller. And then focus it on low calorie snacks and side dishes. If the person has no challenges with chewing or swallowing uh, vegetables, for example, fresh vegetables or even frozen vegetables that are thawed are a good source of a snack with a little bit of dip. Eating quickly. Some people do this. They sort of gobble their food quickly and can lead to potential choking. Try to cut food into small pieces to prevent that choking and avoid foods that are going to be too hot so that uh, if they are taken in quickly, they're not going to burn the mouth. If someone feels overwhelmed at the mealtime, maybe they're eating in a restaurant, think about trying to go to a more calm environment for a period of time or trying to choose restaurants that are more calm as well. Not a lot of loud music, not a lot of decoration, that sort of thing. In your own home, simplifying the meal, um, maybe changing what the table looks like in terms of what's on it, um, getting rid of distractions in the room as well or, or extra noise, things like that. Now, Often when people are living with dementia, they comment on a few key things that they're concerned about. So I have a slide for each of those things next. And so we'll go through them in a little bit more detail. So unintentional weight loss is not healthy. I was actually doing a community talk last week and a woman came up to me and she had, um, her husband had just gone through surgery and she was caring for her husband quite a bit and he was in the hospital. So she was going back and forth to the hospital. And she said to me, she had lost 10 pounds in the last month. And I said, were you trying to lose that way? And she said, no. And I said, well, that's actually not good. And so by not having her husband at home, she wasn't eating, her appetite wasn't there. Unintentional weight loss indicates that something is going wrong. Uh, it could be your appetite, it could be something else, but it's key to get it checked out. Um, appetite does decline with age, unfortunately, and unintentional weight loss is typically muscle as well as fat. And that's not good because we're losing our muscle, we're then losing our function as well. Weight loss and inadequate food and fluid intake are, are quite common, especially as the dementia progresses and it affects the function of an individual, that weight loss. So they could be unsteady on their feet, have falls. It also affects our immunity and cognition. So regardless of having dementia or not, when you lose weight as an older adult, these will have effects because of that. You want to address the reasons for why the low food and fluid intake are happening. Like the example I gave you, the loss of the husband being in, in the hospital, not that having a person to cook for anymore led to no meals happening. So think about why the weight loss has happened over the, the period of time that it has happened over. Is it lack of appetite? Is it a change in routine such as what I described or something else? Monitor weight and food and fluid intake. So it's important to see uh, if more weight is being lost and to be able to report that to your physician again. Even if you're someone who was overweight, unintentional weight loss is not healthy. You want to eat nutritious foods that are also higher in calories to get that weight back on. Um, and it's preferable if you also do this with some exercise to help build muscle at the same time. So thinking about resistance weights, thinking about walking or um, doing other activities that can move your muscles and help you to build muscle back as well. 
So key foods that are nutritious in terms of being nutrient dense, but also have more calories are nuts, cheese and higher fat dairy products. Also, if the weight loss does not stop, it's very important that you get to talking to your healthcare provider and preferably request a referral to see a dietitian to talk about this. It's harder to reverse it over time, so it's best to uh, catch it early on if you can and reverse it. So how can we promote appetite? If this goes on for more than a couple of weeks, you should speak to your physician. It could be due to a medication that you've been recently put on. It could be uh, changes in your physical activity. It might be other reasons. So you need to talk to a physician about this weight loss because, again, unintentional poor appetite and weight loss are not normal part of aging. We know that when you eat with others, you tend to eat better. It's called social facilitation. And so it's the idea of, of, again, eating with others. And there's research to show that if you pick up your cup and someone across from you is also drinking from a cup, they'll tend to also drink at the same time. It's called mimicry. And so this is a well-known thing that we do uh, to support people who might have a poor appetite or poor drinking behaviors. Put on music or the TV, as long as it's not too distracting, it gives company, right, and, and helps to make the mealtime a little bit more enjoyable. But if it's distracting away from the meal, then don't have it on. Create a relaxed environment so people feel more interested in eating. Provide preferences as well. So what do people like to eat that are nutrient dense and energy uh, dense as well? Create visual appeal with colour, the plates. So think about the way it looks. We, we eat first with our eyes, right? So if you can make the food uh, interesting to look at, it's going to be more likely to be seen as palatable as well. Smaller portions might be a strategy to try as well. Sometimes people feel overwhelmed when they see a plate full of food. Um, so you can think about either using larger plates or smaller portions as well. Encourage to start eating. So sometimes individuals who have memory loss or dementia might have a hard time just starting the meal. So you can, might start by putting the utensil into their hand, starting with the first mouthful, and then it takes over that natural in, um, eating ability. If you're finding that appetite is still um, an issue, fluids are often easier to eat, uh, although they do fill you up, but they're often easier to eat and you can consume quite a few calories readily with a smoothie or um, supplements that are available as meal replacements. You can replace the calories and nutrition easier. It's easier to eat fluids and drink them rather than to eat food. It takes a lot of energy to actually to chew food and eat it. And then finally, again, consume energy and nutrient dense foods. Swallowing difficulties. These are general recommendations. So if you've been seen by a speech pathologist or someone else who specializes in swallowing, please follow that recommendation that you already have around how to eat. But this is more in general. Um, people will have swallowing problems that aren't necessarily serious enough to be changing the texture of their food or um, seeing a, a specialist in this area. However, if it is a problem, you're losing weight, discuss this with your physician and try to get a referral to a speech language pathologist or a dietitian who has that specialization. We can't drink, we can't eat well if we're dry, if our uh, mouth and our throat are dry. So have a little bit of water before meals. Again, if it's safe, some people have a challenge drinking thin fluids or regular fluids. They cough and sputter. Um, it goes down the wrong way into their airway rather than into their esophagus. So if it's safe, have water before meals as a way to moisten the mouth and the throat. Choose smooth, moist and softer foods. That's kind of an obvious, right? I think people naturally gravitate to things that are easier to eat as they start to have swallowing challenges. Cut food in small pieces. Use sauce and gravy on meats. Moisten your vegetables with bread, uh, or bread with margarine or sauces. Chew thoroughly and eat slowly. I should add in here as well, don't talk while you're eating because um, that could lead obviously to an opportunity for choking. Alternate your fluids with your swallows, swallows of solid food. So, for example, if you're eating, um, you know, mashed potatoes or something like that and meatloaf, alternate a mouthful of the solid food with a swallow of a fluid. And that will be a way to help moisten and move the food down as well. And again, le learning first aid for choking if that is a concern. 
And my last area around uh, key tips that we see again, potentially with persons living with dementia. Sometimes individuals want to eat the same food all the time, uh, or what we go on call it a, going on a food jag. So they want peanut butter all the time, or whatever it may be. We use the example of peanut butter for this for this slide. So offer complementary foods with the preferred ones. So for example, apple with peanut butter on it or um, celery with peanut butter on it uh, is a good way to get other things into the diet and make it more varied. Continue to offer a variety of foods at the same time. And over time, the person may revert then to eating some other foods as well. They get tired of the peanut butter. Suggest activities to divert attention away from eating between meals, especially if they want to have peanut butter, like again, using example, peanut butter off a spoon just between meals. When they're getting lots of calories, they are getting protein, but it's not necessarily a varied diet, which is what we want to have, of course. Keep the preferred food off the counter. Uh, make it less visible, harder to find, and it won't be consumed. Adapt the food into different dishes. So um, thinking about peanut butter can be put in a smoothie. Um, you can uh, make peanut butter sandwiches. You can put uh, peanut butter into cookies, all sorts of things. And it has that flavor that the person may be desiring, but it comes in different dishes as well. And again, talk with a physician about a supplement and referral to a dietitian. If this goes on for a period of time and you're very concerned about the person's variety in their diet, um, there's other ways that we can try to get nutrition into the individual. So I want to now finish off with a few key resources. And I know that um, the, the BC Alzheimer's Society put together a resource list for you with these links so you can find these for you. This is uh, the DREAM project is a project I was involved with here at the University of Waterloo, as well as with researchers at the Northern, um, Northern BC, University of Northern BC. And we created this toolkit uh, that's available on online. It's meant for persons who are um, working with older adults in the community where they might have persons with dementia being part of their programs. For example, a physio activity program or a congregate meal program like a meal, uh, Meals on Wheels program or eating program that a church may have. There's also tips and resources though in this, um, in this, on this online tool toolkit for persons living with dementia and their care partners around physical activity and healthy eating. There's also a segment on rights of inclusion, that persons with dementia have a right to be included in programs and community activities um, and how we support that inclusion of persons living with memory changes. So I welcome you to go see this website. And as I said, I believe a handout has been created to allow you to, to link to those um, more readily. On, I'm just showing you now some of the things that are on this web page. So there's actually a two page fact sheets on each of these topics there. It's from another project that we call Delight, but they, we put them onto the Dream website because we recognize they're incredibly helpful here as well. So if you're interested in hearing about appetite more or protein, how to bring protein to your diet or plant based proteins, leafy greens, these are all healthy foods that we think are going to promote your health in general, including brain health overall. And so these short two page fact sheets can be printed off in color or black and white. And you can see the figure from our Canvas food guide on the fact sheet that's here. And there's another link there as you can see. As well, the the um, the comments I made about food jags and about weight loss and about appetite came from other two page fact sheets that are again at this um, at the stream website and this is a specific link there for these and again they're typically two pages in length but you can see if there's anything that you might have challenges with like eating challenges pureed foods staying hydrated these these two little these two page fact sheets that might be helpful to you to get some support and ideas Remember, consult a registered dietitian if there's weight loss that's unintentional, poor appetite, and eating challenges, especially swelling problems. And you can go to Dietitians of Canada, find a dietitian to find a dietitian in your community. You'd put in your postal code, and they'd find the dietitians that are working in your community and the type of clients that they take. So I'd like to wrap up now with just uh, hoping to show that we've done our learning um, objectives. We talked about why eating well is important for the maintenance of health and, and brain health as well. We talked about specific nutrient recommendations, specifically calcium and vitamin D and protein, and the importance of following Canada's food guide as a, as a guide to thinking about what should be on our plate. 
We also talked about mealtimes being important to support your well-being, care partners as well as persons having a dementia. We talked as well about some tips to support mealtimes to promote connecting and identity as well as specific eating challenges like having poor appetite. And then we talked about as well about some other considerations and showed you the dream website as a place for other resources to support you with uh, with anything you may be interested in. So with that I will round off. Um, my email is here if you're interested in being part of a newsletter that we have for our lab, which does a lot of this work. You're welcome to email me. We can put you on that email list. So with that I'll stop sharing the slides and we'll be able to have some conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Heather, for that um, presentation. You covered a lot of ground, and I think there's some great tips there, some background on why we eat what we do, what we need, and how to troubleshoot when things uh, don't really go as planned as, as dementia is. Uh, so thank you. We did receive some questions in the chat box that I noted down. Um, so one of them you might have answered at the beginning. Someone had asked about um, nuts for protein. Now, I know that you had alluded to almonds um, mm -hmm. having fairly low protein but uh, good intake of fiber. I don't know if maybe you can speak to some of the other types of nuts yeah. and their relevance to protein. Yeah, basically they're they're pretty equivalent. There's there's not they're not going to be equivalent to a chicken breast. Let's say that. Uh, so um, nuts will have protein. There'll be there'll be variation there for sure. I just use almonds because a lot of people will consume almonds. But walnuts are a good choice because of some of the the oils that are in are in walnuts that might be potentially protective around brain health. We believe um, so. There's these good fatty acids in many of the nuts that we consume, and why they're healthy beyond the protein. So you can think about walnuts are a good choice. Chia seeds, um, sesame seeds, almonds, uh, other nuts like hazelnuts. There's not huge variation, unfortunately, with the protein in them. Yeah. Great, thank you. So I think that question was from Rita. So Rita, hopefully that answered your question. Um, we received another question, and this is something that at the Alzheimer's Society, I remember when Dr. Bredesen came out with his uh, book, I think it was the end of Alzheimer's, it was called, uh, we had a lot of discussion about it. So someone was curious, what do you think of the Bredesen protocol? I'm not familiar with that. So maybe you can outline okay. what that is to me. Sure, yeah, there's, um, I can't remember his first name, but Dr. Bredesen had proposed this uh, protocol that if you follow this nutritional plan uh, would essentially cure Alzheimer's. Oh. Um, so, of course, you can see why we received a ton of questions about yeah. this when this book came out. Um, it is something that the society, um, we don't promote it, particularly because there it, there's no evidence to really support so that it. claim. Yeah. Um, the example that I like to make is that if there was a true cure for Alzheimer's, we would scream it from the rooftops. <laughs> yeah. uh, we wish that there wasn't a reason for us to be here as an organization yeah. that dementia was cured. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, so while we can use nutrition to help with symptoms and management and our daily ability to yeah. cope, um, there is no cure for Alzheimer's that's based on nutrition. Um, unfortunately. And it was one of those things I think some a researcher had gone through and costed out what it would take um, from your family budget to follow the protocol. And it's hugely expensive if you were to follow it. So that would be my only caution is that if you do try to follow the protocol as it's outlined in the book, that is hugely, hugely expensive. And it is unfortunately not backed by evidence. Right. Um, but one thing we did learn from your talk is that good nutrition is always a benefit regardless. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'm going to have to look up the Bradison protocol for sure. And, and certainly um, we see lots of uh, people trying to put forward ideas about how to promote brain health. Um, and the unfortunate reality is none of them have panned out. Right. Um, and if they have, it's very short lived. Um, for example, MCT oil, which um, it can be used perhaps to support brain activity. It sort of acts like uh, ketones in the body, right? Um, but it's very short lived. It's only for a few hours. It doesn't last a period of time. Um, so that's one of the challenges and that that's just emerging research. So we're nowhere near uh, having a cure for Alzheimer's, unfortunately, with diet. We do know that a healthy diet can delay um, or potentially uh, delay the um, diagnosis and having a brain healthy 
diet, which is basically what I talked about today, uh, is one of those ways. And that has been researched. But once someone has dementia, the unfortunate reality is the changes that have happened in the brain cannot be reversed. They're there. The tangles, the tau, the uh, amyloid protein is there and it can't be removed. And so that's the challenge we have before us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Heather. And I think that ties in well. Carrie made a point in the chat box. She said, I understand that it's, I guess, the Bredesen Protocol helps to limit sugar, alcohol, and highly processed foods, which aligns with what you shared with us today. Exactly. In general, that's good nutrition, period. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And there's the Brain Health Food Guide. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I gave you that uh, link, but it's actually in the Dream website link, and I can certainly give it to you as well. It's meant for, again, before someone has dementia. The research that it's based on from the literature is before someone has dementia or cognitive changes. And so that is um, an evidence-based guideline. It talks about walnuts, for example, it talks about green leafy vegetables, uh, what we call cruciferous vegetables as well, cabbage, broccoli, that sort of thing no red meat or very little, very no processed foods, as Carrie has pointed out here. So it's very consistent with Canada's Food Guide, but highlights a few key foods like berries, dark greens, and walnuts as key foods you might want to include because they have certain nutrients that might be beneficial to prevent um, dementia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. And uh, Dennis or Denis um, posted something as well yeah. that I wanted to read out loud. He, um, he said, keep it simple, keep it whole, keep it clean, keep it active. I yeah. love that. May that yeah. be our mantra. Exactly. And I think it, keep it active is really important. That is the, you know, you know that when people do have dementia, keeping active can actually support delaying the progression. So it's the one thing we do know. It also supports obviously your body health, right? So it's really uh, incredibly important to exercise, not just walking, but you know, resistance exercise, if possible, balance as well, um, doing yoga for that and, and, exercise bands for resistance. It's really, really important for keeping your muscle. Mm, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And tying in that exercise piece and as uh, Dennis added on and keep it fun. Yeah, yes. Because exactly. fun will have that sustainability piece. Exactly. Um, Lori shared with me a question that she received over the phone. So someone called in to ask a question. Uh, how can family members work with long-term care homes to address nutrition concerns, especially if they have been dismissed when they first asked? Oh. So that is, if a family member believes there is inadequate nutrition being given in the long-term care home, do you have any suggestions for how the family could address this? Right. And so I think speaking to the dietitian, um, you, you're located in BC. I must say, I don't know the regulation for dietitians, but there are dietitians required, I believe, in long term care homes in, in British Columbia. So that would be a key thing. And talk about your concerns about what is available to the individual. Um, it's a delicate balancing act in long term care. Um, I do a lot of research in that area as well. And so we've got the issue of how much money is available for food, how much staff time there is to make good food. And we know that good food costs money, unfortunately. And then there's also what residents will eat. And so sometimes when it comes to living with dementia and when someone's in long-term care, we're more concerned about the weight loss they're experiencing than the micronutrients that they're consuming. Because we do know that when they lose weight, they're more likely to fall. And we also know that their dementia will progress. And so micronutrients you can get through a micro vitamin mineral supplement, not ideal, of course, but um, offering things that people will eat is sometimes the only option for some individuals with dementia. And then that, in addition to the fact that this is people's lives and it's, it's you know, perhaps the last stage of their life and they're living in long-term care. So pleasure also needs to be a part of, of that experience, right? Uh, my mom's 98 and she she's in a wheelchair she's been in a wheelchair now for over a year and she's worried about her weight gain and I say don't worry about it you know because she loves food and it's one of the few pleasures she has in life so I'm not worried about that um, so I think talking to the dietitian talking about your concerns they and the food service manager will be the ones creating the menu if it happens to be a long-term care home that is more of a corporate home it might have a corporate um, dietitian creating the menu but again voicing your concerns about the nutritiousness of the food will be important but recognize there's these other elements that go into how they plan menus in long-term care and it's a delicate balancing act 
Thank you. That's really helpful. And I think that touches a bit. Um, Sharon made a comment that I'm sure many others share. Um, seems like most care homes offer dessert at lunch and dinner, too much sugar. And then to your point about the pleasure and enjoying and, and really sort of balancing where we get that quality of life from and sort of what contributes to our quality of life. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a nice point there. Yeah, I often talk with my students in my class at, where I do nutrition aging, you know, Earlier in our adult, older adulthood, we're concerned about what we're eating and, and the healthfulness of it. But then it comes to a point where it's eating itself for pleasure is probably the most important part about eating. Mm -hmm. I know I look forward to that point in my life where <laughs> I can just enjoy, yeah. um, as I'm sure many of us do. Um, we had one question too. This is more of just a, a practical question. Will the slide deck be made available after the call? Yes. And that's a perfect. Thank you. I, I realized a couple typos, so I'm going to fix those first before I okay. send it. No problem. Thank you. And just for those joining us, if this is your first time joining and you're not already on our webinar mail list, you can sign up on our webinar website. We'll get that link in the chat there for you. And you can sign up to receive regular emails with reminders about the webinars. And in those reminder emails, we also include a link to the previous week's webinar. So this recording will be shared. So if you want to go back through for another listen, in case you wanted to pick up some of um, that information that was in the slides, uh, we'll also look to try to include the um, the slides in that email as well. So if you haven't already signed up and you're not already receiving those emails, I encourage you, it's alzbc.org slash webinars. Um, and there you can sign up to receive that information. Um, so we do have another question. I'll encourage if anyone else has any more questions, we have a few minutes still to go. Um, so Marina asked, if we are losing weight, we are losing muscle and what else? There was another also, question. Also was, fat. So fat. we typically think of when we lose weight, we're just losing fat, but we also lose muscle, fat, and bone, actually. And so if you're someone with osteoporosis and you're losing weight and you're not exercising, that bone is not being stressed and that muscle is not being stressed. So you're, it's going to go away, unfortunately, or be reduced, right? So it's very important if you're trying to lose weight and you're dieting to do so. One, cut out the extra foods, right? The sugar, the alcohol, you know, the processed foods for sure, the desserts and stuff like that. I know the pleasure, but the, get rid of the things that are not nutrient dense first off in your, in your life. That would be key and exercise because if you just lose weight through diet alone, you still will lose muscle. Right. Mm, that's a really excellent point. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And um, just on that point, too, because we do work with a lot of um, guest presenters and speakers and researchers, and we learn a lot of, along the way that the consistent theme we hear is uh, twice a week for strength training um, and then working in as well some low impact um, exercise in there that gets your heart rate up. Um, but yeah, that twice a week for strength training always sticks out with me. Yeah. Um, so you can enjoy that walk, but make sure you're doing something to really, like you said, test your bones a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Safe and balance too, right? Another one is balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some great programs out there. We have some online programs um, for those of you supporting someone who's living with dementia in the early stage. Uh, we have Minds in Motion online, um, and that is a physical and social activity program that you can join from your computer. We also have it in person. So another way to get some movement in, um, in BC, we have the BC Brain Wellness Program. Uh, you can Google that or we can try to get a link in the chat and they have some online exercise programs as well. And um, I think some nutrition information that you can check out. Um, we're, the Delight program actually, Sarah, is um, we're actually just launching a new version of that and we're going to have a virtual version. So um, circle back to me in a year's time and, and that's exercise and nutrition as well as um, social interaction and, and chatting uh, among a group virtually to support uh, folks. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so just we had another question about where to review the slides. So just a reminder that we will send out the slides um, with the recording in that uh, webinar email that we send out. So if you haven't yet signed up and subscribed to receive those emails, please do so. alzbc.org slash webinars. 
So thank you very much. I guess we'll just wrap it up then. If you have last Great. questions, you can always call our First Link Dementia Helpline. Um, our First Link Dementia Helpline, you can call if you have any questions or you just need a listening ear uh, about something related to dementia or if you're looking for resources. So we can help you with that. Um, but yes, thank you again so much, Heather, for joining us today and taking the time to share this great information. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. You're most welcome. Take care.